welcome all. Um, and in particular, I'd like to welcome our, our guests and their support team. Uh, so uh, Rick Luce from Emory University and Oren Beat Ari uh, from uh, Ex Libris in Boston. And uh, also a special thanks to, uh, to Oren's uh, colleagues, uh, Holly, uh, who runs the Australian office, and uh, to Ziv, who's here from Bangkok. So they've just really come down today to be part of this lecture uh, while they're in Australia. And we want to thank them particularly because they are responsible for bringing uh, Rick to Australia and uh, for allowing us to have him here in Melbourne uh, for some time afterwards. So thank you, we appreciate um, your collaboration on this. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rick Luce from Emory University. Thank you, Philip, um, and appreciate uh, very much the opportunity to come and talk with you today. I want to, uh, I, I'm going to move fairly quickly through this presentation because we have a, a limited amount of time. And I want to start by just sharing some assumptions that I have, I hold, uh, about higher education in the USA. So I'm, I don't know whether these apply to Australia or not. Um, but the first is that institutional economics, not technology, will drive the need for fundamental changes in the universities and consequently in libraries. And institutional economics clearly are influenced uh, sort of at a, a larger macro level. So there's a set of things going on economically that impact institutions and consequently sort of trickle down to libraries in many ways. Secondly, I don't believe that universities are going to receive the resources to keep pace uh, with cost increase uh, and, and sort of the mode that we've been in uh, over the past many decades. Thirdly, I don't believe that libraries can win the content commodity game. Uh, it's not something that we're particularly good at. It's uh, probably the wrong arena for us to be competing in, and we probably ought to think about that as, as we try to build collections. And lastly, I believe, uh, and I've sort of advocated uh, over the course of my career, that libraries must undergo really transforma uh, transformative change to, th to thrive. Um, in part today, we're very much held captive by the journal model, which continues to sort of run unabated. Uh, capturing ever larger chunks of our budgets. Uh, and this has a, a, a tremendous impact on our ability to acquire uh, and treat, in a, in a good way, special collections. So I want to distinguish general collections from special collections. And I believe a, a shifting needs to take place. But I'm going to start with uh, just looking at, in North America, the Association of Research Libraries, the top 115 libraries in the US and Canada spend, on average, spend about 94 to 96 percent of their budgets on what I'll label general collections, more or less commodity things that everybody can get, uh, monographs, serials, et cetera, et cetera. And they spend, on average, about 5 percent or so of their budget on special collections, meaning things that are relatively unique, relatively rare, more or less one of a kind, and certainly would be primary materials. Rather odd if you think about that in the context of a research institution uh, and a library, if you will, being a, a, a resource uh, for research. I'm in my own institution, have moved our model now to about a 90-10 uh, ratio and trying to head it with some difficulty uh, to where I think it ought to be uh, currently about 80-20. And I, it, over time, it needs to continue to, to tilt in a, in a direction. Many reasons for this, a few of which I'll delve into today. It's also interesting that one of the most expensive resources, human labor, that we apply to treat these collections uh, has roughly about the same ratio. Uh, so we're spending the large majority of our collection budgets on what I'll label more or less commodity materials, materials that hundreds of libraries oftentimes collect. And we're spending a large fraction of what our um, human capital uh, treats on those same materials in roughly the same ratio. Again, I think a bit odd when you think about um, a sort of linear relationship in cost, at least, in terms of what we spend to treat commodity materials, general collections, versus what we spend to treat special collection materials as a percentage of our budgets. So we have a staffing model, and I think what, what you see in, in that 
set of relationships, we have a model essentially based on uh, a paper era. Uh, to the extent that our collections are paper, that may or may not be adequate, but increasingly over time, as that shifts, uh, probably we're going to need to make some other shifts. We spend at Emory, and I think this is uh, fairly typical, um, about 75% of our budget that we uh, uh, have available for what I'll call public programs, a anything from symposia, exhibitions, uh, poetry readings, whatever, uh, about 75% of that resource goes into things related that come from and center on special collections as opposed to about 25% related to more general collections. Now, I, 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 I want to step back and say it's not easy to sort of draw arbitrarily a line and say this is absolutely general collections, this is absolutely, there's a lot of gray here. Uh, but there's some things that I think are fairly clear also. So how do we rethink collections um, and, and resources if we're going to try to reduce the proportion of our budget going to, again, what I'm going to label commodity uh, information and reinvest some of what comes out of that in enabling scholarly communication. And for me, that's the whole chain from capturing uh, material as it's being created all the way through how it's curated, stored, and, and preserved. Increasingly, that question it sort of delves into the whole uh, array of, of new issues related to data, media, and things that are born digital, which uh, we're only beginning, really, to grapple with in a, in a serious way. So special collections, essentially a focus on unique materials and then how those are knitted together, not treated as one-off, but actually knitted together in some way, and then folding into that what I'll, I'll label institutional assets. Um, so research, learning materials, institutional records, archives, et cetera. And so I have a, a fairly broad definition of what I think that is. Interesting. Uh, study by uh, Hegel, uh, John Seeley Brown, and, and Davison um, that uh, you, can, you can find in The Power of Pull, how smart, small moves smartly made can set big things in motion. And I love the, the quote that comes out of there. Uh, they talk about knowledge flows overtaking knowledge stocks and importance. And uh, the quote that caught my eye was, big repositories of knowledge, uh, to me is a research library, don't give a university a major advantage anymore. It's having access to the knowledge flowing at the cutting edge that really enables innovation. Now, when you dig further into what they're saying, what they're talking about is it's the interaction of human beings in a, in a physical location around things like collection, enabling tools, enabling technologies, et cetera. It's that aggregation of things that give a center like Silicon Valley a major innova uh, sort of innovative advantage over other centers that maybe there's a collection, but there's no energy related to it. Set of people, but no, no, nothing that really drives uh, any synergy out of that. So if you buy even part of that uh, proposition, it, su it suggests to me that, again, there's a paradigm shift here that we need to think about p a pivot from our, what has been historically our collection-centric view to really an engagement-centered uh, view, where the library's value sort of comes out of the interactions that it provides and really generates in many ways. So if we stand back and try to think about if we were reinventing our, ourselves, research libraries today, and said, well, what's our business strategy going to be to be successful? Uh, and if, if part of our business strategy is to look at um, this sort of uh, grid that I've got, ranging from high items, uh, collections, materials that have high stewardship needs versus low stewardship, things that are in many collections versus in few collections. We spend, again, if you look at that ratio, we spend um, a lot of money, time, and effort in licensed collections and in purchased materials. If we were building a business actually to be competitive, I'd submit we would want to be somewhere down in a, in a, in a different quadrant. Uh, which, again, for me, suggests that's actually a, a quadrant um, somewhere between low and high stewardship, but in few collections uh, is, is where we're going to find special collection materials. So business strategy, as executed today, I don't think really is where this dot uh, is. We're, we're up really trying to execute in this area of, of licensed and, and purchased content. Uh, perhaps a mistake uh, moving into the future. 
So I think there's a, uh, I'm going to call for here an, an end to magical thinking. This religion and the decline of magic. Uh, there are six editions uh, the, of, of this book uh, that were published, held by over 1,100 libraries. And so why do I bring this up? I don't know what the demand uh, at the University of Melbourne might be for this title, but I can tell you in my own institution, which has a very active, um, highly regarded theology department, uh, there's been one call for this book, um, as our records go, over about the past 25 years. Uh, so one scratches their head and, and asks, how many copies do we really need? And when you ask that question, you start to look at um, institutions and one of the interesting pieces of data that's come out of the aggregation of materials that the Hadi Trust has put together and then started to analyze is that you come to the conclusion the books already have left the building in terms of moving from library silos, if you will, uh, individual book towers uh, on a campus to off-site storage, 70 million volumes uh, roughly uh, from the Association of Research Libraries, 30% of Columbia's collection, 50% of UCLA's, well over 50% of Harvard's collection. Uh, so again, the question of what do we need to have sort of focused right in the, in the center of campus in, in private real estate uh, or very expensive real estate um, is an interesting question as we start to think about both physical repositories as well as digital repositories. This question is particularly interested when you begin to understand that a great number of these titles have been digitized. If we can get through the litigation around the, the Google Books uh, question, uh, we'll be able to pull it up fairly easily. So we probably don't need 1,100 titles uh, stored around. And interestingly, there's no evidence that the loss of browsing um, in sort of the main library has adversely affected the reputation, certainly not of Harvard, uh, not of Yale, not of Princeton, uh, nor libraries outside of uh, the USA. Where is the book itself moving? Uh, in, so socially, in our society today, I think that we're, and others have observed this, we're transitioning from a product-based economy to an economy really based on experience. It's all about the experience. And what's the big appeal with the, with the new iPad uh, you know, that's just come out? Well, it's a better experience, right? And so there, you're going to leave your iPad 2 and you're going to go get the iPad 3 because it's a better visual experience. And, and so... That's impacting how we're starting to think about books uh, and how people are starting to think about channeling uh, books in, in different channels, depending on what kind of book we're talking about. But clearly, uh, as we look at uh, e-book readers and so forth, as a book changes from kind of words on a page to an interactive manifestation of information, uh, et cetera, the experience it creates will somehow be related to some perceived value certainly by our younger generation and, and the, uh, the sort of digital natives. Uh, and so my question out of that really is then how well are libraries positioned to support this uh, very different kind of experience? So not the book going away, but the, the book in some ways um, mutating uh, a little bit. And so we're going to have to mutate a little bit our thinking in terms of how uh, we're both going to collect those experiences and then somehow pass on those experiences over time. We have an attention switch uh, kind of working. So we've come from an era where collection resources were relatively scarce, certainly back uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, extraordinarily scarce. And we had an abundant attention of staff, a lot, relatively a lot of staff, uh, and built collections over time. And then we expected workflows to be built around whatever the service in the library was. So we've seen a, a, a switch now, or we're starting to see a switch, where collection resources are actually quite abundant, especially with e-books, with e-journals, uh, with materials being digitized. Staff attention is relatively scarce. Most research libraries uh, around the globe, and I understand this is uh, more or less the picture in, in Australia, are certainly not growing uh, as rapidly. If, in, if anything, they've been rather flat to declining in terms of total numbers while collections grow. And so that ratio uh, and the ability for staff to give content attention becomes more scarce. And so we're going to have to build then services around workflows, uh, which is to start to take our workflows and turn some of those upside down. So I'm advocating here a transition from institution-centric collections to more user-centric uh, 
collections that sort of uh, reflect the network world that we live in. Very, very interesting. If we step back from collections and just think about library services, many of the library services that we have today and that we provided for quite some period of time increasingly are, are becoming more distant to how research is conducted and what some of the needs of, of our research community are. Uh, and so that's a gulf that we're going to have to figure out how to cross. 21st century special collections. Increasingly, this will be uh, a challenge in terms of how we acquire born digital records in a variety of formats. And I'll talk a little bit more about a specific experience with that. We certainly are seeing uh, a greater variety of people interacting with primary materials and, and special collections. Uh, not just the researcher who has very, very deep knowledge in an area, but people who are just casually interested, people who are trying to really combine things across different disciplines, don't have the depth of knowledge, but still are very, very interested in, in these kinds of materials. So our need to respond, which has been more um, deep research, is being sort of, it's now it looks more like a cross. We'll continue to have very deep research in, in these collections. We'll also have this kind of horizontal layer where people are dipping in uh, more shallowly and, and using things in a, in a different uh, manner, and we'll have to respond to that. Researchers looking to find now not just um, records or, or an item, but really to combine uh, items in a variety of ways, uh, and certainly an increase in, in the use of multimedia records. Uh, very interesting, uh, in our special collections library, which we call Marble, the Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Book Library, uh, increasingly we're seeing people walk in not just with laptops and cameras, but really asking, what can I do with this? How can I, how can I get this in a way that I can really mash it up uh, and work with it in, in a very, very different fashion? And, and that's certainly a trend that uh, is uh, found far and wide. The provenance and the context are essential and the value of the resource uh, as evidence remains central. I don't see that going away. Uh, in fact, will increasingly become important, I think, over time as the variety of different things we're collecting uh, continues to, to grow. We see a greater demand in, in special collections also in terms of trying to create virtual spaces. So, why would I get on an airplane uh, to go do research on uh, the best 20th century English language poetry collection in the world, which is at Emory University, if I was in Melbourne, unless I had a good sense of the specific book, the specific edition, that's, is actually available at Emory. Uh, and so I'm going to need to be able to do that uh, electronically. And, and so those expectations about how we're going to interact with special collections in many ways are parallel to how we see people expecting to interact with our general collections today. Uh, and so we need to raise the bar in terms of um, not just the metadata, but the collections themselves and, and how we think about digitizing those. In my own institution, uh, I arrived at Emory about uh, nearly six years ago, and special collections were a, a silo, sort of a world, a library unto, uh, unto, completely unto themselves. Entire set of, if you will, infrastructure support team isolated as a separate silo. And so that silo has been broken down. Uh, it's far less costly. We've integrated it with the library, and we're able to leverage um, resources in, in the library system and can focus the staff in special collections on the things that they can do uniquely. Certainly no breakthrough, but was, it was uh, interesting to watch the culture uh, resist that uh, as we went in that direction. So I, we see a declining emphasis on uh, must-have content as, again, as things are, are kind of moving um, both electronically and as we start to think about moving collaboration in the cloud. So if I can uh, look at uh, materials, uh, regardless now of where I am physically, we can start to think about our collections in, in very different ways. And this is a piece of the puzzle in terms of thinking about the questions of scale and how we deal with network uh, effects. We are bringing in, uh, what I call hybrid um, staff into um, our, our special collections. And this ranges from the humanities to the sciences. Uh, I am less interested that someone has a library degree than they have deep domain knowledge, they have an ethic about service. 
uh, and they have sort of a willingness to collaborate and an ability to be able to collaborate. And so I have now uh, increasingly joint hires where we'll hire uh, a professor of poetry who is half-time curator in our special collections, uh, the Dan our Donowski Poetry Library. Hire somebody who uh, is half-time doing um, work uh, in, with cancer research uh, and part-time in the library uh, working in the area of informatics. And so in, as we continue to grow positions like this, it's giving us the ability to really start to, to get very, very deep into our collections and reframe how we start to think about, um, in many ways, providing access to the collections because we have experts day-to-day -day kind of interacting with the collections, not just coming once or twice trying to solve a problem, but day-by-day -day curating, living with the collections, et cetera. That's a trend that I think uh, will grow. I certainly see my colleagues beginning to pick this up. Um, and so non-traditional non staffing pattern, uh, I think, is something to watch. We're trying to adapt our, our physical space, um, again, to, to make it more engagement-centered. So even with special collections, moving things out of sort of the pristine space and opening that space up for, uh, we're going to have receptions, we're going to have exhibits, we're going to have things that really draw people into the collections and then be able to deliver not everything in that space, but as needed. Uh, kind of just in time. Too much of, of library space, now going back to general collections, too much library space today is focused on collections. If your building is full of, of shelves, there's no place to, to, to study, there's no, no group studies, et cetera. Um, and so many of us are trying to dig our way out of that. Uh, lastly, I want to uh, say that the, I, I believe that we need to start to reassert our role in terms of uh, enabling um, uh, and, and partnering, uh, providing tools um, in the area of scholarly communications. Uh, and this is a, particularly an opportunity in the area of data publishing, uh, which I don't have time to go into, but would be happy to talk with you more one-on-one. -on -one. So where does this take us? I, I've mentioned a focus on engagement. Uh, it's interesting that a number of libraries over the years have tried to build repositories, uh, build it and they'll come and then wonder, well, how do we get, how do we get faculty material in there? We can't seem to, to draw it. So we need to, to move away from this library-centric idea of describing the institutional re repository and morally why you ought to uh, deposit material and instead adopt a more user-centric approach which is focused on research support which would lo logically sort of bring materials in there because we can offer more than just here's the ability to retrieve an article. We can fill needs in the area of scholarly communication, help with identity management, data curation, uh, liaisons uh, with faculty to understand some of the new tools coming out, et cetera, as well as trying to uh, integrate with things like learning management systems and so forth. Increasingly, we're seeing things move to the cloud, um, everything from uh, integrated library systems uh, uh, and so forth, um, getting out of the business of trying to manage server farms and, and really stepping back away from that and, and trying to look at what we can do uh, in a core area. Thirdly, um, the area of deep collaboration uh, as we start to share systems infrastructure so that all of us aren't kind of reinventing the same wheel over and over again. The physical space, um, again, using our, our special collections area really to showcase and harness the power of uh, our collection investment and building public programs around that, bringing specialist equipment in, specialized staff, um, GIS experts, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and creating a social uh, space that really gives the sort of dynamic of knowledge flows uh, to the space. So let me talk about Salman Rushdie uh, for a minute. We acquired his, his papers, uh, his collection, uh, about, uh, about six years ago. And with the collection, he wondered whether he had had a couple of computers. A couple of them didn't even work. Were we interested in that? Yes, we were. Uh, we thought it'd be very interesting to try to understand how a writer ha writes uh, and, and essentially practices his art from paper uh, and writing things out literally, the longhand notebooks all the way through everything is on, on a machine. And does that change the creative process? So we've built uh, a site um, that, unfortunately, due to restrictions from, um, from, from Rushdie, that it, you have to come to Emory to see. Uh, that's something we didn't have control over. I don't know what's going on there, but um, 
what we trying to what we've learned in the process of curating as materials is that digital materiality um, really has this notion of context that's critically important to try to understand uh, much of, of what's going on as you start to look at his material that was created uh, on these old Apple computers. So here's a uh, sort of was a first effort. We've got, uh, we've got a bunch of files. We provided a, a library interface and stood back and said, that's not any good at all. It doesn't matter if you can't read it. It's sort of a classic way to go in and, and look at files. Um, uh, you know, here's a, um, a return on Salman Rushdie. That, that doesn't really help you understand at all what's, what's in these computers. And so we had to kind of shift our thinking about how do we deal how do we deal with a collection like this uh, and stand back and say part of the value is to understand how text has been marked up in a computer over time and to preserve that uh, and to create files that we can actually bring that back. So we're maintaining original format uh, and emulating what that looks like over time so one can go in and actually look at the files exactly the way that Rushdie did with, ex with the limitations of the software as it was. Uh, when he was writing these materials and so forth. So we're very much pre preserving that actual environment itself. Uh, preserving, uh, you know, here's, uh, here's one of his directories. Uh, you know, there's a directory in the middle there on Midnight's Children, et cetera. And you can now, um, again, at Emory, you can sit down and interact uh, with a machine running this emulation mode, open up the directories, understand his file structure, et cetera, et cetera it starts to give a little bit of insight into certainly where was that technology at that point in time, but you can begin to uh, understand some of the organizational processes, uh, et, et cetera. Looking forward, we're really then trying to take these, take these collections and look at how we can bring other tools uh, and resources into this kind of environment and how we can look at both the, the born digital materials that we emulate and add some other kinds of capabilities uh, in, into this. For example, the ability to be able to, to notate uh, and annotate uh, material as you bring it up, be able to save it, take it back out as you're doing research. So we've seen this born digital um, effort with Rushdie as kind of a learning opportunity to understand what are we going to do with born mat uh, digital materials as people continue to give us hard drives, uh, uh, electronic files, et cetera, et cetera. We can think of certainly a plethora of other possibilities. Uh, you know, uh, provide services that disambiguate names, uh, disambiguate institutions, uh, how we uh, think about optimizing uh, impact of things, how we assess things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so we could add these kinds of things and, and have kept these these kinds of capabilities almost as a separate silo, and now are beginning to think about how these might start to integrate with, with these sorts of collections. So how do we think differently uh, a little bit about uh, the question of special collection materials? If, if color uh, isn't the right, you know, I remember it's got the purple spine. So if that's not how we do things, what are some of the other opportunities? We've built uh, a space called the uh, Research Commons. Uh, we're specifically trying to uh, work in the area of digital humanities in the space and really thinking about the space as a laboratory. Laboratory in the sense of we don't understand the organizational structure needed to be successful uh, over time and so that's, it's experimental. The libraries, it's in the library but not totally owned by the library. It's shared, if you will, as a resource with faculty, IT, domain experts, and so forth, and then bringing in people from the social sciences, for example, to bring in ge geospatial, uh, geocoding uh, information with, with things that uh, people are trying to plot, uh, let's say, how a particular uh, movement moves in, in geography over time. And as we've done that, uh, we're building collaborative relationships with the faculty that uh, the hope was that we're beginning to see. We've got a history professor talking about something uh, in a deep area over here, happens to see another application and spark, starts to spark ideas about, ah, I wonder if this widget would work in, in my application area. And so we're trying to, in essence, uh, kind of cross-pollinate or, or uh, cross-fertilize ideas from one area to another, and that's part of what we're trying to do uh, in this particular space. So some of the early things that have come out of uh, this effort, um, Professor, uh, one, one, um, one of our professors uh, was um, 
had to go to the world court uh, to defend herself uh, that, the, that the Holocaust uh, did in fact uh, occur, was a historical event. It seems absolutely uh, almost unbelievable, but we documented that. Uh, there was a site, so all the materials that went into the world court that was put up on a website. We saw, well, be great, let's just have a documentation of this. That led to um, Holocaust deniers then trying to put up all kinds of information that, that sort of pervade their um, warped view of, of reality in a way that what we realized was that we had a moving target. And so this has been a very, very interesting um, process whereby we'll put up factual information and these deniers will come in with, with uh, uh, you know, some, some permutation of, of something that they w want to do. And so then we've got to, we've, we've responded over and over in time, translated this site into Farsi, um, Spanish, um, Arabic, uh, a couple other languages. Uh, but very, very interesting about uh, a website sort of really having to mutate very, very quickly over time. Chronicling uh, um, disease eradication. Uh, we work closely with the Center for Disease Control and they eradicated smallpox and went on and weren't uh, very interested in sort of the historical record. And we stood back and said, wait a minute, this is actually quite interesting to document how do you go into other cultures and be successful when you do that? Because it's not about the medicine, uh, it's, it's about really the sociology of how one interacts in a way that the medicine actually gets taken or, or the cure actually uh, sticks. And so this has been a, a very rich website um, for us. A third example is a, um, a project started out, uh, an Emory history professor, uh, David Elsis, came in and uh, said, I've, I've been collecting information on the transatlantic slave trade covering about 500 years, documenting voyages. I've got too much information to fit on a CD-ROM. What, what, what should we do with it? So we, after talking with him, uh, it was obvious. It needs to go on a website. The light bulb finally went on for him that once it went on a website, the people that he'd been collaborating with in Brazil, in the UK, in Africa, uh, could see his research, could contribute to it, and all of a sudden it, re it really exploded uh, in, a, in a wonderful way. So this site, again, is not static. It's uh, very much a dynamic database. It goes through a set of uh, peer review. They continue to collect information over time. You can go in and search on names. Uh, there's an interactive timeline so you can understand what's happening at a given period uh, in history. You can do some data modeling with the site. Uh, you can bring up maps that will sort of show voyages and where uh, human cargo was brought on a ship, how many actually survived. Uh, as they were taken off the ship and so forth, along with images, photographs, et cetera. So this is an example, really, of taking primary materials, very, very rich, using digital technology to amplify uh, what one can do, and then being able to stand back. And now we've got scholars saying, we can really start to understand uh, how do you ask questions about 70,000 voyages uh, in ways that we simply couldn't do one by one by one. Um, so I think a great example about how these two worlds, it's not kind of a, an, e, a, an or question, paper or digital, but actually they can, uh, they can work together. A couple of lessons that uh, we've learned uh, in this process. The first is we've got to act on what's really core. Um, and in special collections, I, I, we need to stay focused very much on what's core. We come uh, and live in a culture where um, we've got to understand that perfect is the enemy of the good to get anything done. And so we're going to have to change some of the DNA in, uh, in, in our cultures uh, as, as we try to scale up uh, what it is we're collecting and, and how we're treating things. I believe that over time, shallow infrastructure is going to win. Um, you, you can't develop such deep infrastructure that you've got so much invested in an infrastructure with technology moving that we can't migrate what we've got from this to the next thing, to the next thing. Uh, and fourthly, that uh, well-functioning workflow support really is a value added that the library can provide and, and support in, in the research uh, process. We can see that in the area of data curation, data broadly defined. Uh, we can certainly see it in the area of, of editing rich, uh, rich content. 
So last lesson, um, culture does eat strategy for breakfast uh, every day. Uh, I've learned this the hard way uh, over my career. So to make change, if, if, if you're interested in any of the pivot that I'm, I'm talking about, you're going to have to figure out how to get focused on the culture, because that's really the fundamental challenge here. It's not the technology. In many ways, it's not even the money. It's really about trying to, to uh, refocus the culture. So I want to leave you with a concluding thought. Uh, I know I'm about out of time. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a very simple one. Different isn't always better, but I really do believe that better is always different. And when it comes to special collections in particular, um, for me, this is a, a thought that applies. And um, with that, I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. And I want to turn things over to my, my colleague, Oren. All right, uh, hello everybody. My name is Oren Bedari. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Philip very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, what I would like to do in uh, the next 10 minutes or so is uh, to share with you some thoughts from the perspective of a technology, library technology um, 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 and services provider. Um, a few thoughts about um, what we think um, needs to happen in order for us to be able to get there um, with some of the changes that we talked about. Uh, you know, there's obviously a dramatic change in the manner in which uh, scholarly um, research, scholarly communication is being performed. Um, and to use a quote from Daphne um, Renfro from uh, University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, um, who contributed a, a piece at the No Brief Candle Report. Uh, these changes um, have created a very different context for the missions of academic and research libraries. Um, and it will impact um, the set of skills, uh, expertise, uh, and procedures that many libraries will need to implement uh, going into the future. And, I really do think that uh, we are facing, fundamentally, we are facing a paradigm shift um, because not only that we need to do things differently, uh, we need to change many of the things that we're doing today, uh, but also we need to start doing different things, different and new things. And um, so we're really looking here, I'm sorry, um, we, we're really looking here at um, uh, a significant change, um, and um, I think that um, you know when, when you look at uh, the areas of change, there are very many areas of change. We at Ex Libre started a few years ago uh, to develop a new framework for library services through the introduction of uh, pieces and components such as Primo and Alma. I'm not going to talk about um, our solutions today, but rather try to share with you very briefly, very quickly, a few thoughts uh, about what I think in essence needs to happen in terms of the supporting infrastructure um, that provides libraries the tools um, to make this transition and to implement those changes. And the focus, indeed, um, from my brief talk will be in the area, in the context of collections, uh, following Rick's um, uh, paper. Um, so, when talking about collections, there's, there's, there's traditional collection development policies are, are changing radically. Um, we're seeing this in, in many places around the world. Uh, and Rick obviously touched on this. Um, there are many factors that are involved in this. And again, covered um, in the previous presentation, issues of scale and the abundance of information, the unsustainable business models of, and the cost of uh, scholarly and commercial scholarly information in particular, um, and the unsustainable business models. Um, I think that there's also um, you know, a huge shift uh, when libraries are moving from ownership models that are really typical for physical collections um, to access models, you know, subscription-based uh, access models. Uh, you know, a whole new set of things come up and change the way that libraries will look into their collection development policies. Um, and with that, I think, there is also a shift in libraries that we're seeing in many libraries um, that changes from um, libraries uh, looking after their collections and presenting their collections to the users, um, ra rather moving to um, 
you know, trying to support the, the, the needs, the information needs of the, of the users and trying to connect those users with access to information at points of need. Um, and lastly, and not less importantly, I think, um, there's also a change in the uh, definition of what counts uh, to be part of library collection. Um, you know, for years, uh, many libraries focused on materials such as uh, books and journal and other types of uh, scholarly artifacts uh, that primarily, you know, correspond to final output of research project or research engagement. Uh, more and more so, we see uh, more and more interest to deal with a um, little bit earlier outputs of the research and education processes. Um, so, you know, different types of outputs coming from social networks and social activities um, and th those sorts of things as well enter into, you know, kind of a big new um, um, equation that libraries will need to deal with. So, change is mandatory. It's happening. Uh, it started. And the questions that we ask ourselves and communicate with, with, with our um, library communities is how do we get there? Uh, what do we need to do um, as we see changes in policies and missions of libraries as, as Rick uh, addressed before? What are the set of tools that need to be developed in order to support that, those new missions and policies? So I'd like to really just touch on um, five. Again, in context of collection development, um, and um, unfortunately, it will be just in a title level, and I definitely will be interested in continuing discussions, perhaps one-on-one -on -one later. Um, and I would like to categorize those changes um, into two categories. One is that we need to do traditional work a little bit differently, um, and we also need to start introducing new tools to support the new things that I think many libraries are keen to do, uh, looking into the future or, in fact, doing already. Let's start with the first category, and let's look just for a moment on redundancy. Again, Rick uh, touched on this. Um, going back to Hattie Trust, another um, you know, angle of um, the, the statistics that they released about a year ago um, tells us that um, 750,000 books are held by uh, more than 100 libraries. Now, Rick also um, mentioned the fact, what, what does it mean that we have so many copies of the same books? But I would like to focus just for a second on the fact that this means that we have almost 75 million bibliographic records that are duplicated. Uh, that's a lot of records. So in responding to that, you know, I would like to suggest that the first thing that we need is to really, you know, quite radically change the way that we implement our bibliographic control processes. I'm talking about cataloging, you know, processes that start from selection and acquisition through cataloging, um, authority control, and those sorts of things. We have to make them a lot more efficient, um, streamlined, and collaborative, especially for those commodity collection or common collections that Rick uh, pointed out. There's just an awful lot of waste that is going on. And I think this is true in all markets. And it's really about leveraging the cloud, or in the heart of it, is um, leveraging more of cloud opportunities. Um, you know, we really need to tackle fundamentally the supply chain, reduce overhead of moving and copying records around, you know, getting started earlier in the process uh, of material deliveries, getting closer perhaps to the origination of some of the descriptive metadata that is produced with scholarly items. We definitely need to reduce duplication, both for data, through perhaps sharing, um, you know, new models of sharing, like some of the radical models of sharing that uh, Rick um, mentioned in his um, talk, um, as well as processes. You know, think about authority control processes done over and over again in each research library that I'm working with, um, and doing more or less the same, the same procedures, using the same data. Uh, we can leverage the cloud and um, offer a lot more, um, I think, um, efficient ways to do that if we really take a close look at these. Um, as well as I would like to suggest that, especially with the growth of scale and the fact that we have less people to deal with more material, uh, we really need to look more into automating things. Uh, we, we need to move more to rule-based, exception-triggered type of processes. Uh, we need to have... Um, 
work tasks pushed more toward librarians and information um, uh, specialists instead of having those information specialists pull information from systems to work on. Uh, this is a change in the way that our systems needs to help us accomplish our work. So I talked a little bit about traditional work and let me just say a few words about um, what type of tools do we need in order to do new things. So in the traditional kind of context for library services, um, you know, libraries curate material, print material in the past. This is, this is the past. Um, collect and curate uh, print material, catalog them, preserve them in the physical sense, and then provide um, uh, discovery and delivery um, uh, services for them. As we transition into the digital age, I don't think this changes much. Um, what does change is the types of material that we deal with. Now we're talking about different range of special collections, learning content, research content, and so forth. And those type of new materials will require new tools. We have to extend our metadata management tools. We have to go beyond the traditional mark, which did us a good service for years in helping us deal with primarily print-based, monographic-based um, collections and introduce new schemas, introduce new data models and rules and tools. You know, some of those schemas that I, I list here, um, you know, DC mods, RDA-based, uh, if this will ever take off, uh, METs and so forth. But I think, not less importantly, we have to get away from this silo-based approach to resource management where we have specialized systems for you know, more or less single material types. We have specialized systems for print materials, typically in an integrated library system. We have specialized systems for electronic resources, um, electronic resource systems. We have a range of digital uh, repositories and digital asset management. I think we need to move into a more consolidated frameworks that will enable us to deal with scholarly and potentially cultural uh, materials uh, regardless of whether they were born print or died digital, uh, regardless if it's a monograph or a complex digital object, because this is what the users are using, and they're not making that uh, distinction the same ways that our systems are making um, in the back office side. Fourthly, as we move to digital um, realms, we need to look not only on the collection and the management, but also on preservation. And we need to actively preserve our materials, otherwise they will not be there forever. And fifthly, I would like to argue that because almost nothing is certain by, by change, our systems and our tools have to be open and extensible. We need to give you the tools so that you can make decisions when you want to update your system, when you, you want to add another method, perhaps even another scheme, another workflow, so that you don't have to wait for your vendor, perhaps us, perhaps somebody else, to make that change. We're not making those changes fast enough for you, and we're not making it right enough for you in all times. So you need to have the opportunity to do it yourself through um, open interface, excuse me, open interfaces. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to both Rick and Oren. They've posed lots of uh, juicy questions, uh, lots of, uh, I suppose, uh, paradigm shifts came up through both questions, uh, both presentations. Do we have any questions? Craig. I, I just got, I'm, I'm uh, from the field of uh, digital humanities. We've actually got our uh, first national conference next week um, in the field here in Australia and New Zealand. but. Um, when you, have you got a particular way that the library engages with researchers? Like, do you have a, a specialised lab, say, say like the University of Virginia or, or something like that? Is there a particular we, we, program or something you have? Yeah, so in this research commons, it, it, it is a specialised lab. Uh, part of what we have in there is we've got um, humanity scholars that 
essentially partner with the faculty member. So the faculty member has a research idea, maybe doesn't have the knowledge about how do I pull this off in a digital world? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to build a database. How do I do that? Uh, I have a database. How do I visualize the information, et cetera? So we have people on the library staff who really partner with the faculty in that space. Um, referred to the importance of focusing on core activities in special collections. So I wanted to ask you what was core for special collections at Emory and how you resolved that, that question. So first of all, we've, we recognize Emory became really a research um, institution, only a, 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 a real research institution, only about 30 years ago. And so we had to stand back and say, we're never going to catch up to Harvard, Stanford, Yale, in terms of uh, number of, of, of volumes we're going to have. Uh, so we're going to be very focused. In, in special collections, we've identified areas. Um, uh, in, in literature, African American uh, history and culture, uh, we have a very strong health sciences department. And so we've, we've got about five areas now that we've targeted and said, these are the areas we're really going to focus our collections on. Uh, a number of institutions collect in the area of Southern history. Um, so we're not going to throw away those collections. We'll be glad to take them if they come in. Uh, but we're going to try to be more focused in terms of what we're actually collecting. And so that's a, that's a piece of it, to be very, very targeted about what we're trying to go after, as opposed to saying, so we're the repository for anything that might fit in special collections. Um, so that's, that's the first piece of the puzzle, if you will. Secondly, it's, it's a, a question for us of then, um, we clearly don't, we don't believe we have enough staff to do all the kinds of things we'd like to do. And so we really look at the collections we're acquiring to the extent we can to make those living collections. So we're not interested in bringing a collection in and just sort of putting it back in the, um, the collection morgue. Uh, mm -hmm. Rather, we're, we're really interested in figuring out how do we really bring some life to this? If it's a living author, uh, we've got the author in to, to you know, give uh, talks and symposia, et cetera. If it's a collection that uh, we can uh, figure out once it's been uh, gone through arrangement and description, you know, can we do something in terms of exhibitions, uh, et cetera. And so we're always trying to evaluate from that kind of lens. Um, thirdly, we have a very active program, uh, pu public programs um, effort going on. And, and, my, and frankly, a piece of that is, is related to our mission. Uh, a piece of that is related to trying to engage supporters around what we're doing in ways that they, um, they become partners and contributors. So we're continually building public programs around these focus areas in ways that continue to draw uh, people into our collections. For example, um, I mentioned earlier poetry. Uh, we had uh, on a, a beautiful Sunday afternoon uh, with perfect temperatures at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. People would have many things to do in Atlanta. We had 1,100 people turn out to come hear Billy Collins read poetry. Uh, the night before, we brought Billy Collins in, and, and uh, I was telling Phillips, uh, did a, a, a fundraising activity that was quite successful. So we're looking at ways to leverage um, a variety of different things with these collections, really as kind of a nucleus of energy, and then trying to bring people in uh, that can interact with the collections that, that sort of bring them alive in many ways. Do you have a marketing department that assists in um, helping you um, develop a strategy to do what you just mentioned? I'd love to, um, but I don't have a marketing department. I have a, a very small development team um, really trying to look at uh, the areas of uh, building relationships and fundraising. That's two individuals. Uh, I have a, a very small staff in the area of public, um, supporting public programming, but don't have a marketing department per se. Is Barry Kion, cataloger in the University of Melbourne Library. Warren, I have a question for you. Do you know of any vendor or institution that has made good progress on integrating the new schemas and including Mark into their metadata management tool? Yeah, well, we, we're definitely working uh, in this context. Um, and um, 
you know, the, the, the new, uh, what we refer to as a next generation, a new framework for library services on the back end side um, that provides tools for librarians to manage, for example, metadata um, is extensible. So in our solution, Alma, um, we do have a metadata management system that uh, goes beyond MARC and includes um, those schemas. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an extensible metadata management system. Um, I, I can't really speak much about other solutions, but I, I predict that these will emerge because I really believe that this is a critical component in a next generation system. One last question. Okay, well, I'll draw it to an end. I think we uh, were very privileged today to have both Oren and Rick here to talk to us. Um, both of them have impressed me over a number of years. Uh, I see them both as thought leaders in the industry, coming from different areas, but I think we found today that there was incredible synergy uh, in their two presentations. Um, I think that we, um, we really engaged with the examples that Rick gave us from, uh, from Emory, particularly, uh, you know, Rushdie, the Holocaust denial, the smallpox eradication, and the transatlantic slave trade. And they're, you know, real genuine research projects that your university has been intimately involved in, and you are gathering those collections and uh, preserving them, you know, often electronically uh, into the future. And it, I guess there was a nice synergy then with what Oren said was, you know, what is a scholarly item? And I guess it's all of those sorts of examples that we had today and many, many more that we have yet to dream about. And so I think it's been a really exciting um, presentation today. Thank you both very much for coming and giving us uh, your time and your grey power. And um, uh, please, uh, Thank our guest speakers in the usual way.